I want to begin by just reading to you some statistics at the moment. 2023 mental health statistics show that women are twice as likely as men to experience depression. According to the World Health Organization, suicide is now the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. More than 700,000 people. You heard that right. More than 700,000 people die due to suicide every year. Guilt is not a joke. This is not an insignificant topic. In Scotland specifically, in 2021, it was recorded that one in 10 adults reported ever having self-harmed. One in 10 adults. How many adults have you seen tonight, today, this week? The highest proportion recorded in the time series. One in every 12 Scottish men have depression. And one in every 11 Scottish women have depression. So if you came here tonight thinking that you've never experienced guilt, I just wouldn't believe you. I just would not believe you. Everyone in this room, at some point in their lives, in some degree or another, has experienced guilt. Whether that was when you were little, just a kid, and you did something wrong and your parents told you off and you felt guilty because of that. Or maybe you feel guilty now because you know you've wronged someone or you've done something wrong. Guilty because of past trauma. Guilty because of past disaster. Guilty because you made a decision on that day. On that day. R.C. Sproul, as he's been already mentioned, haunted by guilt. Guilty because you have thoughts or desires you believe you shouldn't have. Guilty because you hurt someone you love. Guilty because you failed to meet someone else's expectations. Guilty because you're doing something right now you know is wrong. Or even, even guilty because you're not doing that which you know you should do. Am I not speaking your language? Am I not hitting a nerve? Don't we all, in some way or another, understand what guilt is? How devastating, how paralyzing, how depressing guilt is? We've all wronged someone. We've all been wronged. We see so much of guilt in street view. If you don't know what that means, that reference is in Google Maps when you put the little man in the street and then you can see the, the buildings, you can see the apartments, you can see the street view. And so much of guilt we see in street view through human lesson, lessons, through just a human perspective. And tonight I want to zoom out. I want to not just look at guilt on a human level, in a relational level, but you've come here tonight <laughs> expecting someone to talk about God and how Christianity tackles the topic of guilt. So we will do that. Matthew 26, we're going to be examining two people from the 12 disciples. We will read little sections of Matthew 26 and be basically just basic context. These are the final moments of the earthly life of Jesus Christ. First of all, let's see Judas' betrayal in verse 14. Verse 14 of 26. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid them thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Skip down now to verse 47. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. 
Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. So that's the account of Judas' betrayal. Now skip down to verse 69. We will see Peter's denial. Same chapter, verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, notice that. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Within these verses, Peter's and, Peter and Judas share so many things in common. You must understand that these two men were close disciples of Jesus. They both saw the miracles Christ did. They both ate on the same table that Jesus Eight. They both heard Jesus preaching boldly about the kingdom of God. They both bought food and drink for Jesus. They both had lived life for three years with this man. And yet, within these verses, we see them both essentially rejecting. Both of them rejecting, denying, betraying Jesus. The Jesus they have been following the past three years. See, in many ways, guilt is a very difficult topic because it involves both the subjective felt guilt and, and also the objective elements of guilt. Subjectively speaking, guilt is felt. Feelings of guilt are a universal problem. We all feel God has written His law on our hearts and therefore we all have some universal sense of right and wrong. We all know right and wrong. God has given you a conscience. When we do not know what is wrong, your conscience starts to alarm, telling you what you just did was wrong. It's almost like it takes your breath away. It was, it was a guilty feeling at that moment. Guilty feeling. The Bible does not disregard guilty feelings, by the way. If you read Psalm 38, you see there clearly David describing his guilt. Just listen to this. My wounds stink and fester. Because of my foolishness, I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day long I go mourning, for my sides are filled with burning, and there, are no, there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. My heart throbs. My, light, my strength fails me in the light of my eyes. It has also gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague. My nearest kin stand far off. That's guilty feelings right there. That's pretty vivid. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that way? Do you identify with David saying, My heart throbs, my strength fails, guilt haunts me day and night, I can't sleep, I'm depressed, I know I've done wrong. I wonder if you feel that way. I wonder if you can identify with David. So in a sense, the Bible acknowledges, acknowledges the present reality of felt guilt. But we must admit that guilty feelings cannot be relied on. Guilty feelings cannot be relied on. It is possible for you 
to feel guilty for that which you have not done wrong. Did you get that? It is possible for you to feel guilty for that which you have not done wrong. But at the same time, it is possible for you not to feel guilty for that which you have done wrong. You should feel guilty about that. A man who has been charged with sexual assault against a little girl may not feel a single ounce of remorse. Yet everyone in this room knows he's objectively guilty. Right? Here in our text, we see two men having both problems, both felt guilt and both objective guilt. With Peter, we see that he is objectively guilty. Moments before his denial of Christ, Jesus actually foretells Peter's denial. In verse 35, if you read with me, 34 actually, there, verse 34, Jesus said to him, Truly I I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. What's Peter's response? Verse 35. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter was objectively wrong in saying that. But more than that, he was objectively wrong. He was objectively guilty of rejecting Jesus Christ. Notice that when we read his denial of Christ, at every turn, he had the chance. He had the chance to stop and to see himself rejecting Christ and to stop there. No, but he kept going. He kept going. He didn't stop. He relied on his strength of will. I will not deny you. He relied on his own moral compass. I decide which is right and wrong. I can do this. My own character. My own goodness. Is that not what the people of Edinburgh do? How many people have you met in the doors? I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good person. How dare God challenge me with hell? I'm a pretty good person. Live my best life now to the best of my own ability. Relying on my own goodness. Relying on my own character. I'm pretty good. Have you not said, have you not said this before? And yet in relying to self... They reject Christ. They reject Christ. How many people today have we spoken to? How many people today have you already spoken to this week who openly reject Christ? That's what the world is doing at this very second. Rejecting the whole idea of Christ. Don't give me this Jesus thing. Don't want it. There's there's not so much hatred towards Muhammad, is there? There's not so much hatred towards Confucius. There's not so much hatred towards Buddha in the world, is there? And yet, you switch on the TV, you go to Netflix, or you just hear a normal civil conversation in the streets, and you hear the name of Jesus being used as a swear word, day by day by day, using the name of someone they don't believe in. There's so much hatred against this one man. Peter was objectively guilty, but more than that, he felt it. Did you notice? He felt it. He went out and wept bitterly. He felt the bitterness. He felt the heaviness. He felt the immense pressure of his own guilt. And if you read the, if you read the, the account of Peter's denial in Luke, it is said that when Peter denied Jesus for the third time. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord, on that very moment, turned when Peter denied him for the third time, looked at him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the intense, weight, bitter, Guilt that he felt when Jesus' eyes met his. Can you imagine? He went and saw the very eyes of the man whom he had just rejected. 
And now you're looking at the word of God. And who knows whether your heart is rejecting him right now. How about Judas? How about Judas? He too was objectively guilty, but we all know that. He too was objectively guilty of rejecting and betraying Jesus. No one forced him to go to the chief priest. Who forced him? No one. He went volitionally. He went with the intention to reject Christ. As a matter of fact, we read that he sought an opportunity, actually. He sought an opportunity to betray him. But with Judas, he betrayed Christ, not with words, but with a Judas' kiss. Notice that? How many people call themselves Christians nowadays? How many people call themselves Christians nowadays when in reality their life betrays their own profession of faith? How many people confess, yes, I'm a Christian, and yet every day they betray Jesus with a Judas' kiss by the way they live? Their own profession of faith does not match their lifestyle. Yes, I'm a Christian, and yet I still live like the world. Judas is kiss. They will tell you that they love Jesus. They will tell you that they follow Christ. And the next hour, privately, they betray him with a Judas' kiss. How about you? You profess as well to be Christian, don't you? Judas was objectively guilty, but even more than that, he felt it. If you have your Bible still open in Matthew 26, turn to Matthew 27. Just next chapter, verse 3. Verse 3, chapter 27, verse 3. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. He went and hanged himself. At least to say Judas felt his own guilt. He felt his guilt so much that he acted on his guilt. He his felt guilt and his objective guilt became reality by hanging himself. Public display for everyone. Notice, both Peter and Judas were objectively guilty by rejecting an innocent man. They both went through intense, weighty, debilitating, bitter feelings of guilt but they both ended up in two different places. They did the same thing essentially, but they both ended up with different outcomes. And right now, as I speak, they both are in two completely different places. Now you need to come to a realization, my friend, that if you came here tonight with a genuine, real guilt, because you wronged someone or because you have been wronged, I need to tell you, you are more guilty than you think you are. Let me repeat that. You are more guilty than you think you are. God has given you life and breath. He has given you family. He has given you food. He has given you love. He has given you laughter. He has given you excitement. He has given you opportunities to enjoy yourself. And yet not for one moment did you give any notice to Him. Yet for one moment did you ever give Him thanks. He sustains your life every second. Your heart beats because He allows it to beat. Your lungs breathe air only because He gives you the air to breathe. Your eyes blink your ears are working only because He allows you and sustains your life. And yet, and yet, you choose to exchange the glory of the immortal God for your own gods. And you choose to worship your own God instead of the God who gives you life and breath right now. 
I'm not guilty. Are you sure? You are more guilty than you think you are. You read the commandments in the, in, in the Bible. You really think that you've obeyed them all? You paid no regard to Him. You openly and completely defy Him to His face. You look at Jesus in the Scriptures. You hear about Jesus in the streets. And not only do you reject Him, not only do you deny Him, not only do you betray Him, but you openly mock Him to His face. Oh, this Jesus thing. And you disdain Him to His face. Now, I don't say that to be mean. <laughs> I just say that to be real. We exchange the glory of God. Romans 1 actually says this of you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear about Jesus. Don't tell me the truth. Don't tell me that I'm a sinner. Don't tell me that I deserve help. That's, that's, that's not what I want to hear. Let me suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. There's no such a thing as atheism in the Bible. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. I've got a master's in this. I've got a master's in that. I've got a PhD in this. I looked at this in a scientific manner, claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The scariest thing about this, the scariest thought that I have right now is that you would hear what I just said to you and be like, I don't care that I'm guilty before God. I don't care that I'm guilty before God. Friend, I'm scared for you. I'm scared for you. If, you, if, you, if that's how you react, the scripture says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Romans 1 says that you know God exists. Your conscience confesses this and yet you do not honor Him. You have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Judas exchanged the Son of God for the world's treasure. Peter exchanged the Son of God for the world's reputation. Who are you exchanging God with? Who are you exchanging God with? Who is your God? What gives life meaning to you? Is sex your God? Is fitness your God? Is money taking the place of God in your life? Is success? Is it your family? Is it your own reputation? Is it games? Is it drink? Is it food? Is it career? You choose other things to be your God and yet you really find quickly that they do not never satisfy. They never satisfy. You always need more. Friend, you are more guilty than you think you are. You have completely broken all of God's laws. The scriptures say that we hate, not passive. And anyone whom you have talked with that has no Jesus, they're not passive about God. The scripture says that they hate God, they are enemies of God. You don't like the idea of God because that means moral responsibility. The main problem of the atheist is not so much intellectual ignorance, but moral denier. Because if there is a God, that means I don't have self-authority. If there is a God, that means I don't have self-autonomy. That means that there's someone up there that has seen everything I've thought, everything I've said, everything I have done privately. And that is not a nice thought. <laughs> that is not a nice thought. That's not pretty. If I were to have, listen, if I were to have a DVD with me containing everything that you have ever done, containing everything that you have ever said, containing everything that you have ever thought, 
you would probably tackle me right now. You would tackle me right now. You wouldn't want this to be played before everyone here tonight. Why? Because it's not pretty. This DVD, what it contains about your entire life, is not pretty. You'd be ashamed. You'd be guilty. And yet, I know these are very uncomfortable thoughts and I'm getting to the good news. <laughs> Remember early on when I read to you Psalm 38? David's description of his, feel his feelings of guilt? He didn't stop with his feelings of guilt. He didn't stop with his feelings. He transitioned from his feelings of guilt to his real objective guilt before God. Listen to his own confession. This is what he's saying right now. He transitions, right? For I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I, I am sorry for my sin. And then he confesses, do not forsake me, O Lord. Oh, my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Friend, visitor, you will never feel freedom from guilt if you don't transition to your real guilt before God. Do you know why? Because the guilt that you feel because you wrong someone else will not go away even if this person whom you have wronged forgives you. Even if they forgive you. Why? Because you will always feel, I need to make it up for them. I need to make it up for them. I need to make it up for my wrongdoings against this person. That's your justice kicking in. That's your justice. Sense of justice kicking in now. True freedom from guilt involves both forgiveness and justice. Both forgiveness and justice. Even if, you, if the person you wronged were to forgive you, the guilt will still linger because you will feel like you need to make it up for them. Friend, let me tell you, if you want true freedom from guilt, you will need both forgiveness and justice. And the ultimate question you must ask yourself tonight is this. You're listening? The ultimate question you must ask yourself tonight, my friend, is this. Where will I find both forgiveness and justice? Where will you find it? Peter's and Judas found them in two different places. <laughs> See, Judas knew he was guilty. As a matter of fact, he tried to make things right. I need to make it up. We read that when he saw Jesus condemned, he changed his mind. Meaning, literally, he regretted and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Here, take it back. Do something about it. He, he tries to make things right. He confesses and tries to get forgiveness, not from Jesus. Notice, he does not seek forgiveness from Jesus. He seeks forgiveness to the chief priests. And he doesn't get it. He doesn't get forgiveness from them. And so inevitably, where does he go? Payment. Justice. I will pay the price for my own sin. I will undergo the payment of my own sin. Next thing we see is him hanged publicly for all to see. He got what he wanted. He got justice. As a matter of fact, he's going through it right now. 2,000 years after this account, he's still paying. He's still paying the price. Forevermore. It will not stop. That's hell for you. How about Peter? We actually don't see him until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Running to the tomb, seeing that the body of Christ was not there. But seven, verse 75, he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I don't know where he went. I don't know what he exactly said after this. I don't know what he did. But I know this, that he wept bitterly. Do you know what that sounds like? For I am ready to fall. And my pain is ever before me. 
I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. He is at this very moment having what 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, godly grief. Godly grief producing a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. He had genuine sorrow for his own sin against the Son of God, against God Himself, and with godly grief produced a repentance. And if you don't know what repentance is, it's a turning away from sin and a turning to God that leads to salvation. So we see Peter weeping for his own sins against God upon the realization of his real objective guilt and turn to God for forgiveness. And for payment. That's the amazing good news. The good news is that we can find full forgiveness, full justice for all our guilt before man and before God on the cross of Jesus Christ. You can find full forgiveness and full justice on the cross of Jesus Christ. Friend, on that cross, Christ is not merely undergoing some Roman torture, death. It's not just, there, there, there are not just nails upon a, a wooden cross. But on that cross, you must understand that the wrath of God that should fall upon you is being poured on the Son of God in your place. On that cross, the just punishment of your guilt, your, the just punishment of your sin, was being poured out on the head of the perfect, sinless Son of Man, Jesus Christ, so that His perfect righteousness may be given to all those who repent to God and trust in Him for salvation. What will you do tonight? On that cross, my friend, your guilt before God is being paid for. The justice of hell It's being poured out on Him. And you can also find forgiveness for all the sins that you have committed ever for God. Past, present, future sins. Remember what I said earlier on? True freedom from guilt involves forgiveness and justice. Listen to what Jesus says as He hangs on that cross. Forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. And then moments later, justice, satisfied, it is finished. Essentially saying, I paid it all. Justice is satisfied. Friend, you can have a life without guilt on the cross of Jesus Christ. You can have a life without guilt, not just before man, but before God on the cross. You can have 100% assurance of forgiveness of sins and satisfaction of justice in Jesus because He proved, He proved to be the Savior of the world. He proved to be the Redeemer of sinners by rising again from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. He came out of the tomb, rising again from the dead so that when you die, you can live with Him forevermore. Christ came only to save sinners. So if you came here tonight perfect, Jesus didn't die for you. You're not a sinner? Please walk away. Jesus didn't die for you. You're perfect? Are you a sinner? Congratulations, you meet the requirements for whom the the Son of Man, the Son of God died for. Well done. You're just like us. Well done. You have finally reached the point where you realize that you have done nothing else but sin against God. Friend, this might be the last time you hear a message like this. This might be the last time. And I can assure you, no other belief system, no other belief system can answer the vital question of justice and love, which can only be found on the cross. And so I, I genuinely beg you, I don't care who you are, I beg you, I beg you, look at the guilt you have before God 
Not just the guilt you have before others or any guilt. Your guilt before God. Look at it. See your great danger of hell. And I beg you, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent from sin to God. And He promises you by the authority of Scripture that you will be saved. He will forgive all of your guilt. I do not want your blood on my own hands. God has brought you in this building on this day, on this specific night, to hear this specific message. He calls you tonight, repent. He calls you, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can assure you, He will forgive you. And so as I close, listen to the words of Acts 17, verse 32 and 34. When Paul was preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Acts 17, 32, it says there, that upon hearing the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. But some men joined Paul, verse 34, and believed. How will you leave this building here tonight? Will you leave this building mocking Christ? I don't want your blood on my hands. Will you leave this building saying, I will hear about this again. I will hear you about this again. No, don't worry, I, I can delay it. I beg you, do not delay. You do not know whether you're going to hear a message like this ever again. You do not know whether this is your last chance to turn to God and to believe in Jesus to save you. What will you do? Peter and Judas gives us a picture of the two options you have tonight. One decided to take punishment of his real guilt upon himself. The other trusted in someone else to take the punishment on his behalf. One asked forgiveness to their own person and turned to himself for justice. The other asked forgiveness to God. And turn to the cross for justice. The other one is worldly sorrow that leads to death. The other is godly sorrow that leads to repentance and life. Who will you be? What will you do? Will you take the punishment upon your own self? I pity you. I pity you. Or will you take and trust in someone else? who took that punishment for you. He died for sinners. Friend, God himself promises you that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. There is life without guilt in Jesus Christ. Christ. There is life without guilt in Jesus Christ. Repent to Him and trust Him to save you tonight. Please, if that is you and if, you, if this is something that weighs upon your own heart, talk to Ali, talk to me, or talk to Pastor Chris or Brother Tommy. I finish with these words from Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that indeed you have sent your only begotten Son. We have given up tracks saying, what has God ever done for me? Lord, we have seen that you have done something for us in sending your only begotten Son 
to come into the world He created and to die for worthless, filthy, puny little sinners who deserve nothing but hell. And He had your, your tender mercy, your amazing, astounding grace reaches reaches to the highest of skies and to the lowest of hells. And you are able to save to the uttermost. Lord, would you please use this message to the glory of your name to bring people, Lord, to the kingdom of God. There is no power, Lord, except in the gospel. There is no power except in the words that you have written in the word of God. And so, Lord, use this to the glory of your name. And may those who are going through deep guilt, that you would find them, that you would rescue them, and that they would seek you, Lord, to find free, full forgiveness, free and full justice in what you have done on that cross. Thank you that we're not talking to a dead man, but a risen Savior. That you are enthroned, reigning, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to you be the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.